guys, I hope your week is going well. In today's video, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the role for probiotics and prebiotics in skincare. This is something that you all have asked me to touch on in a video, specifically shortly after I received in my FabFitFun box the Tula Probiotic Skincare Purifying Face Cleanser. You um, have been asking me more and more about a video in this vein. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today and I will briefly mention my thoughts on Tula and the, the products. So when we talk about probiotics and prebiotics, what are we talking about and what is all of this, this talk about the microbiome and why is it important? The microbiome refers to the organisms that colonize a particular environment and in terms of human health, that environment largely is an organ system. And the role of the human microbiome in disease pathophysiology and human health is an area of active research that is fascinating. Due to advances in scientific techniques that scientists use, biomedical techniques, uh, scientists are able to now have a better understanding of the diversity of microorganisms in different locations on how different disease states and different medications influence those populations of microorganisms and how those microorganisms talk to our immune system to guide optimal function and outcome as well as to influence disease states. And I have a video talking about um, oral pre and probiotics for skin health. So check that out, but today I'm just gonna talk about topicals. And I'll remind you from that video that prebiotics are a non-digestible food ingredient that when consumed can promote the growth of the microbiome, say for example, in the gut. And by and large, this is fiber. Fiber is a non-digestible food ingredient that helps in the success of your gut microbiome. You can think of prebiotics sort of like fertilizer for your microbiome, but a prebiotic, not only is it fiber, but it can be really any ingredient that supports microbiome diversity and overall health of your microbiome. It's kind of a broad, broad reaching term. Probiotics, on the other hand, are true live microorganisms that are not part of your normal flora, but when consumed and or in the case of products applied to the skin can promote the growth of beneficial bacteria in those areas. And so it's important to understand though that the term probiotic specifically refers to alive, not dead microorganisms. The skin microbiome is huge, and in fact, we underestimated how big it was in previous studies because we didn't take into account the fact that not only is the surface of the skin colonized with its own with the microbiome, but down in your hair follicles, your hair follicles have their own their own microbiome. It's an environment that influences your skin microbiome as a whole. So initially we were going on estimates of a surface area of two meters squared, when in reality, when you take into account hair follicles, it's actually 25 meters squared. So the breadth and extent of the cutaneous microbiome is massive. And we know that in the case of the skin microbiome, location is key. The location on the body of the skin microbiome varies in terms of different sites. The microbiome in your armpits, for example, is much different than your microbiome on your face. and is much different than the microbiome on your forearm, for example. Areas of the body that are, that make, uh, that have more sebum, have more oil, they have different, different microbial inhabitants than drier areas. Areas that are, that are under friction and have a slightly different pH also have a different, have a different uh, skin micro, resident microflora. So for example, the pH on your face is about 5.5, whereas the pH of the skin and your armpits is about 6.5. 
So you can imagine how that would influence the resident microflora in those areas, and in fact, it does. Not only is the skin microbiome huge, and not only is it different depending on different areas of the body, but it's also something that changes throughout your lifetime as a result of many things. It's influenced by your age. So for example, around puberty, when sebum production is high, higher, uh, then you have more propioni bacterium, or has now been named cutie bacterium, uh, that contributes to acne pathogenesis. Uh, and as we get older, wiser, our body makes less sebum, we make less ecrine sweat, uh, our skin is drier, and the extent of our microbiome is different. Also, your occupation can influence this and your environment. So if you work and or live in a very humid environment versus a very dry environment, the resident microflora on your skin is going to differ. And the other thing that can influence your skin microbiome is uh, whether or not you have skin-on-skin -skin contact with another human. In the case of uh, mothers who breastfeed infants, we know that that can influence the child's microbiome and the mother's as well, skin-on-skin -skin contact. Also, if you um, sleep in the bed with somebody else and have skin-on-skin -skin contact, that can that can influence your your skin and your skin health, believe it or not. So if you've got great skin, you know, you can you can give some thumbs up maybe to to your partner, to your um, to your spouse, to your significant other, say thanks. <laughs> um, and if you have if you're having if you're having a bad skin day or what what have you, then you know maybe you can maybe you can blame it on them. <laughs> um, but anyways, yes, skin on skin contact can influence it as well. So it's compelling the idea that you could potentially put um, bacteria and microorganisms on your skin that would help keep your skin microbiome strong and help promote an ideal microbiome. It's also compelling like the idea or interesting the thought that you could feed your skin food that you know would be food for the microorganisms there. Then the skin barrier actually can function optimally in protecting you from the outside world and it also is optimally suited for for uh, dealing with the day-to-day -day environmental stressors that we all interact, that we all encounter, whether it be UV damage from the sun or pollution, generating oxidate, um, generating uh, free radicals, uh, our microbiome aids in, aids our body in, in handling those things. We now know. But we really don't know much about the role for putting pre and or probiotics on the skin in topical formulations. It's certainly an interesting idea, but it's not something that we have good evidence for at all. We know that uh, from studies of infants with eczema, that infants with eczema or atopic dermatitis who used, who, who had a moisturizer applied to them, I shouldn't say who used, unless they're just very, very advanced infants, who had a, a moisturizer applied had um, not only a better, a more optimal skin pH for skin barrier function, but they also had a, uh, they also had more, uh, a more dense skin microbiome, microbial flora, more dense and more diverse. So it suggests that consistent use of a moisturizer is supportive of not only a skin barrier, but also of su supportive of, a, of the skin microbiome in eczema. So it's compelling for people with eczema who suffer from issues around the skin barrier and having a weaker skin barrier that predisposes them to disease flares. We also have some studies looking at consistent use of a cleanser and how that in, impacts the microbiome, specifically cleansers that contain benzalkonium, which is an antimicrobial. When the forearm was washed with those with cleansers containing benzalkonium, the microbial diversity was decreased. The amount of resident microbes were decreased in comparison to the side that was not cleansed. So cleansing probably influences the skin microbiome to a potentially negative, negative way, but we don't fully know. Um, it just seems very likely given what, what studies we do have. Uh, that emollient use, moisturizer use probably is helpful, and too much washing, too, much anti, too many antibacterial soaps, washes may be harmful in, in influencing how your skin microbiome is best able to function in, in keeping your skin healthy.
But what about Tula? <laughs> so Tula, Tula products contain um, bifida ferment filtrate, which is a bacterial fermented filtrate. Now, fermented foods and ferments, fermented filtrates, are not true probiotics. They don't have a very high concentration of live microorganisms. And the other suspicion that I have with the Tula probiotics or the claim for probiotics in skincare is like, are they truly live microorganisms in this? Because in order for this to be a face wash, there are ingredients in this that act as preservatives to keep out bacterial contamination, bad bacteria that we don't want contaminating our skincare products. So in the true sense, they're probably not probiotics. <laughs> now, that being said, bacterial ferment filtrate is also probably very rich, it seems, in humectants and maybe antioxidants. So I'm not saying it's not a beneficial ingredient, but the claim that it's a probiotic that's going to contain live microorganisms, when I also see methyl chloroisothiazinolone, which is a preservative that should not allow for bacterial growth. I'm very, very suspicious about the claim that this has probiotics in it. As far as prebiotics, uh, Tula skincare products contain chicory, which is a uh, fiber. Um, and so, you know, when consumed, that potentially seems to be, it seems to be helpful for the gut microbiome. But your gut and the physiology of your gut is so different from your skin. You don't have stomach acids on your skin. So while these are in while prebiotics are non-digestible, they still are altered by the gut environment in a way that is going to be very different from the skin. So what I'm saying is how bioavailable are prebiotics in topical skincare to the microbes on your skin? I question that. <laughs> um, but it doesn't seem to be harmful. My main issue with Tula, which is, should come as no surprise to those of you who watch me, is that all of the products contain fragrance. Fragrance is uh, irritating to the skin and it definitely can cause, uh, pe people can become sensitized to fragrance and uh, subsequently have an allergy to it. So even though you may be using fragrance today, um, you know, use of fragrance at any time, you can develop a sensitivity to it. And a lot of fragrance compounds act as vasodilators and cause redness and irritation. So that kind of takes you several steps back. Also, a cleanser, uh, you know, I don't know how helpful washing bacteria, if this did have functional bacteria, which I'm highly suspicious of, I don't know how, how useful that's going to be. But Tool is not the only brand that makes claims about, um, about the microbiome. Another brand, a couple of brands that claim to include prebiotics, um, are brands that I actually use and like and frequently recommend to you guys, specifically La Roche-Posay. Um, La Roche-Posay, this is a Telerian um, double repair face moisturizer that I love. <laughs> and they also have a double repair face moisturizer with sunscreen. So, you know, kind of a nighttime and a daytime moisturizer. La Roche-Posay products contain uh, thermal spring water. Thermal spring water has been used in um, since Roman times actually for many different diseases, not only in the skin, but also lung diseases, as well as a variety of other health conditions. And thermal spring water, there's actually a center in France that treats people with eczema using a series of bathing, baths and skincare, skincare routine basically, centered around the use of thermal spring water. It's called balneotherapy. And so it seems so very promising in people with eczema, so in helping the skin barrier. There's also treatment there that happens for people with, that, that is done with patients with psoriasis. Um, so there is, there's compelling evidence at least that the use of the thermal spring water may be helpful um, in, in people with those skin conditions and good. And what is good about it? Well, one thing that it seems to have is a high concentration of certain um, minerals, certain elements that are conducive to cellular processes that would support your skin microbiome. Thermal spring water contains selenium and strontium, which uh, are helpful in aiding some of the 
uh, cellular enzymes and potentially may explain why the use of this spring water seems to be so helpful in this balneotherapy spas. If you guys would like a separate video on thermal spring water, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, so it's in, you know, La Roche-Posay products and it's also in the Aven um, thermal spring water. So, you know, that that is a little more compelling to me. Uh, at least we have more clinical evidence of it being helpful in those conditions, how, it, how it's working and whether or not and to what extent it influences the skin microbiome, we really don't know. Uh, but uh, it does seem to be helpful in aiding skin barrier recovery and healing from inflammatory skin conditions. And La Roche-Posay, you know, these are great moisturizers. The Tellurian Double Repair Face Moisturizer, it has, not only does it have the thermal spring water in it, but it also has ceramides in it, which we know can help restore the skin barrier. It's got niacinamide, which is helpful for calming down inflammation. And uh, so, you know, the claims that this is making um, about being a moisturizer is exactly true. This, this can help in uh, skin barrier maintenance consistent use of a moisturizer. Just as in the case of those studies looking at infants with atopic dermatitis, this type of product can do that. I hope this video is helpful to you guys in kind of explaining the differences between pro and prebiotics and my reservations about jumping on that bandwagon. Uh, but uh, comment below and if you'd like a video on thermal spring water, I'd be happy to do that. Talk more about the other potential benefits in thermal spring water, the beneficial components. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.